Thank you very much. And I'd like you to join the, the next panel. So thank you ever so much. And let me also introduce uh, back on stage, Doug Little, CEO and founder of InSpace. Also uh, back on stage would be Carissa Christensen, CEO and founder of Bryce Tech. And group captain John Hetherington, uh, deputy head of space enablement for the UK Space Command. So please uh, welcome all of you. Now, I'd just really like to, to get your thoughts. Uh, uh, Paul, you know, you've listened to all of the panels. Obviously, you've outlined, you know, what a, such a busy few years you will have in this dangerous decade. No wonder uh, the command is expanding so rapidly, as, as John's been pointing out. Um, but what really struck you um, from what you heard from these panels? What was the standout, would you say? I think definitely the thing for me, because it's the thing that I, I don't think we have got right just yet, is how we procure new capability. You know, I could sense the odd smirk in the audience uh, when, we talked, uh, when I talked about what it's going to look like in, um, in 2035. And certainly when we go from that sort of single front door bringing SMEs in understanding what capability um, that, uh, that might be the silver bullet uh, that we need and then rapidly procuring it. We're not actually, again, there might be some smiles. We're not eternal optimists. We're not actually that far away. Um, certainly, one of the big things out of this is that I wanted to mention, uh, I'm working with Paul Russell and DNS team at the moment so that we can have a, an industry day debrief of what has happened so far in terms of that procurement. And I do want to hear the, you know, the tough stories from Della from Maxar or uh, Anita from MDA or Doug from, uh, from InSpace um, to see how dealing with us looks from the other side, you know, whether it is a rush to get a PQQ in, whether it is not having a conversation when we set our requirements in the first place, whether the surprises plop onto the doormat uh, or the email inbox so that we can try and, uh, and spirally develop this. Um, and we're building that evidence. And already we've made a couple of changes to how we do things. It's kind of incremental at the moment. Um, but I think that is probably the biggest thing for me because I think we're doing a great job in terms of workforce. You know, we are recruiting people. Um, what Joanna's doing uh, and you know, a range of different people are doing to, uh, to just enhance the space workforce across the community is working. What we're doing in operations is working. It, for me, it comes back fundamentally to the capability and how we bring that on and, and keep it at the leading edge. That okay. was a long answer, wasn't it? No, that's great. Thank you. Well, let, let's ask Doug for his uh, kind of key takeaway, really. You, you've uh, been on the panel. You've listened to the other uh, panel discussions. Uh, what struck you? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a few takeaways. Um, I think it was clear, I guess, from the first session and also from the industry and innovation session uh, with Mark Roberts that, we, we need to have that joined up collaborative approach. You know, you know, we can only solve problems if they're shared. The expertise at the moment is still, you know, acknowledged as being mainly on the industry side. There's a lot of work being done to, to, to manage that and to create um, strong capability on, you know, on the, on the defence side. But not holding us at arm's length, I think is key. You know, looking at the diversity, it, it, it's clear that, you know, and I think it was a really great analysis by Carissa looking at, you know, we're not only reducing risk, but we're increasing resilience if we um, look at diversification of, of the workforce as well as the things we do. Um, some fairly harrowing uh, statistics and anecdotes along the way. Um, and I guess, you know, it, for me, we ended up, in, in, you know, there's, there's the, the male, pale, stale people being allies, and that's part of it, but it's also... It's just full stop creating a safer space for people to thrive in the sector. So individuals can come in with different uh, elements of diversity and they can succeed in the environment. Because this then leans into the sort of John session with retention. You know, there have to be opportunities for career growth. There has to be good pay. There have to be people that want to stay with those employees and with the sector and not to go, well, actually, I don't like the space sector. It's full of old white men. I need to go somewhere else. This, you know... So it's showing that we're an agile, we're an exciting, we're an interesting place to work. Um, you know, and space is cool, and we all agree that, because we wouldn't be in this room otherwise, I suspect. But it's making sure that people out there still realize that there's something about our sector that's exciting and attractive and offers a, a career. Um, great to see the Space Academy upskilling. And, and you know, it, it leans across again to 
things you know my own company and other companies are doing around the sort of innovative um, approach to filling mid-career roles, bringing people in from adjacent sectors or even from completely, you know, from miles away, sort of sectorially, but you can pull them across because they have the transferable skills. And yeah, again, I mean, Heidi made some great points, you know, that effectively we're about creating positive narratives about how space helps that gives students the ability to feel they can make choices to join defense space, not just space. Um, finally, um, Goddard's, I think it was great to see the reinforcing the importance of space as an operational domain, the amazing growth of Space Command. If I sort of compare the growth of my own company in the same time, um, wow. <laughs> and I think we sometimes forget that. We, we get frustrated because we're industry. And we want to go much faster than everyone else. Um, but you know, Space Command is growing, and it's growing fast, um, but it is still young. And, and building in, you know, baking in diversity is a must-have in the first place. The key role the UK is taking in space domain awareness, hugely important. Um, promise we will get to Tanya on time. Um, thank you for reminding <laughs> Everyone heard that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and thank you for reminding us we've got a dangerous world. Number one space ops squadron, much better than when I started with Skynet in the 90s, and it was 1001 SU. I think, you know, number one space ops has got a better ring to it. Um, and you, you've kind of stolen my joke, I think, which is your vision of 2035 and beyond was fantastical and believable, but far-fetched as far as agile procurement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, I could see you. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much, Doug. Carissa, let me get your, your kind of main takeaway, really, from, from all that you've heard today. So um, uh, those were a remarkably thorough summary, so let me not re retread that ground <laughs> and, and, and step back uh, a little bit. Uh, the UK, it's, it's extraordinary even in the last uh, five, or five years or so since I think the, the first uh, UK space defense conference that, uh, 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 that occurred, the degree to which the community has coalesced, institutionalized, um, uh, we're seeing programs moving forward, we've seen UK startups, we've seen the enhancement of the industrial base, we've seen a more visible profile globally. So there are so many positive uh, elements, I think, in terms of progress. I do have to say, though, I, I am struck by the continued, by a continued challenge. And I think that it came out in each one of these panels in a different way, which is the fragmentation of the UK space enterprise compared to a vision uh, of, of what it could be. The UK is a comparative, it's not one of the largest actors. It is by most standards a reasonably homogenous actor. Those are ingredients for the potential to have agility be a defining characteristic of the UK space enterprise in engaging with the massive market of the United States, in being a decision maker and a supporter of a growing industry, in being a participant in Five Eyes, a, 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 a serving, working with the market in Europe. There are so many opportunities that would be enhanced by a more agile, more um, operational, functionally integrated UK space enterprise, and I, I offer that as a plea because I think there are opportunities that are being lost because that is not a shared goal. And I think that if it were a shared goal, it could drive success across commercial, national security, and civil space. And one final note that I'll offer there to just emphasize the point, we've seen this surge of venture investment a large number of startups, including many UK space companies, the national security community has a disproportionate amount of influence on the success and outcomes of those companies over the next five to 10 years. There, there are challenges on the commercial, commercial customer side. There are uh, increasing national security threats that are well aligned with those capabilities. And so government procurement policies, government acquisition strategies, government's vision with regard to those companies and those subsectors 
are really going to have a disproportionate impact on business outcomes. And I think that's something that a more integrated UK space enterprise could approach more effectively. So, Carissa, thank you very much. And John? Thinking about my own panel, I think my big takeaway, and I think all of us in the panel agree with this, is that we can't still be talking about the same challenges in 2024. We have to, I think we've, we've understood the challenges really well. Now, I think they've been articulated across this year in a number of different events. There are tangible actions that we've identified as a group. Um, but if this time next year we're still talking about those challenges in the same way, we've, we've failed collectively. So we, we need to move the conversation on to action and, and make progress over the course of the next 12 months. Having said that, <clears throat> it's clear that we are doing a lot of things right. And one of the themes was coordination. And I came in to the, to the forum today believing that we were doing good coordination because I see it. I see it all the time in my day job every day. But this has reinforced that to me that there is a huge amount of coordination. There's a huge amount of joint effort, joint understanding. It genuinely does feel like people are all wanting to go in the same direction. Um, and that coordination will be vital to achieving my first point, which is to try and to make a progress in some of those areas like skills um, and, and recruitment going forward. Space is definitely cool. I mean, we've all said it now. It, it, it is cool. We have that advantage and we need to harness that inspiration you can get from space to, to, to then move to the next, the next level. And it is on all of us to play that role in creating space awareness. I heard over the years, many people talk about sea blindness and people don't really understand the impact of um, trade routes and things on, on the economy and how things work. And I think space blindness is absolutely a thing. And, and it's, it's been able to collectively as a group get that message out that space is critical to everything we do. And once that's understood, then we'll find doors much more easy um, to open. And that takes me to my final point, which is the Zen Gen Z thing that came up a few times. I don't happen to think that Gen Z is particularly, I don't think they're an alien species that would be on the planet. I don't think they're that different than, than we are. They are in some respects. I've got kids, I can see that. But in many other ways, they're not. They want, they want the same things that we wanted, a good job. They want to have a good pay. They want stability. They want um, challenge and they want the ability to, um, to get up in the morning and feel like they're doing something important. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we give them those opportunities. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Mark? You open the conference, um, you're here at the end. If you were speaking at this conference in 10 years' time, this is a question that's come from the audience, so I thought I'd put it to you. Right. What would you like to have achieved? What do you not want to still be talking about? Most of the things that we've talked about today. <laughs> uh, I, I absolutely agree with Carissa on, on the opportunity that there is here. And I think somebody, I think you used the word in association with uh, one of the questions, uh, used the word frustration. Um, I think um, my, my reflection is there are certain areas that we've been, I, I talked about SME access to MOD. I used to, when I was on the other side of the fence, tell SMEs that we are sorting out access to, uh, to MOD, and that was about 13 years ago. So, so clearly that sort of thing is, uh, is not, we're, we're not getting it right yet. And, uh, and I think uh, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be talking about that in 10 years. I don't want to be negative about this, though, because I think one of the things that's come out today is a, uh, a real willingness. Uh, the fact that you're here, given the space conference fatigue that's going on at the moment, the fact that you're here, I think, is an incredibly positive sign. I think we, the, the questioning um, of the various panels has been extraordinarily positive. Everyone is, everybody wants this to succeed, and, uh, and, and I think it's important that we do. Uh, when I gave my remarks, I, I was pretty careful not to make the strategic thing about MOD strategy or necessarily government strategy, because in a sense, I see them as slightly different. Uh, I see the government's ability to execute strategy as not particularly brilliant, uh, but I see MOD's um, uh, ability to ex execute the strategy as just articulated by Goddard's, uh, you know, over what they've achieved. And what's coming up over the next few years is absolutely excellent. That was, it's not, I don't think you could ever describe it as a hospital pass, getting uh, the first command of, uh, of uh, space is cool. Um, but that was, a, that was a very significant challenge. And I think that we, you know, we've seen some of the team here today. And Christ, they're, they're impressive. 
Um, and you know, we know that the defense uh, part of space is in good hands uh, and is going, to, is going to power on. So I think my, my last thought is we need to probably progress nationally without the need for exquisite knowledge and the skills thing. I'm really pleased that you're on it, Joanna, because the skills thing, we, I think we've sought exquisite knowledge before really making, it, making any progress there. That's ridiculous. You can carry on researching that forever and not actually achieving anything. So the fact that we're actually executing that is, uh, is a really good sign for the future. Uh, so it's uh, frustration was the first part of my answer, but real positivity about what we've seen today. Um, and I thought the diversity panel was extremely powerful. Okay, thank you very much. It certainly was. Um, I'm going to go, we don't have that much time for questions. So the most popular one is, how is space likely to fare in the next spending review? And this is from Lewis Fielder from Deloitte. Um, certainly from my perspective, I mean, the reason I talked about 2035 is because now that we're up and running, and I talked about the sort of three-year focus that we've had, and Mark, you're not wrong about the carnage uh, right at the beginning when you open all the cans of worms and they disappear across, and you've got to try and straighten them all out and get them back into the tin. But um, if you look at the way uh, cyber across government um, started off small and then started to grow. Um, whilst we haven't yet got our capability demonstrators into space, actually an awful lot of the ground network, um, the workforce growth, everything else that we're doing has already given us enough ammunition to go into the next spending review, the next integrated review, whatever it happens to be, um, with the ability to pitch for the next stage. And uh, you know, Carissa, you mentioned the, the sort of joined up approach. And I think it is only because the joined up approach has only really happened since now DSET got a space directorate, since we had a space directorate, since there started to be that central government function, since we got a national space council. Now that we have those and we're gradually rolling through versions one, two, three, four, et cetera, um, I think it's a lot easier to be joined up as all of these things start coming together. And it, I see it with Space Command in terms of it, it always feels like slow progress. But when you look back at a year or two years or three years, you've come light years from where you started. So I think the UK is definitely on this journey now. Um, and we're working through you know, cross government. And this is, I see it more in this domain than I've ever seen in the other domains, the maritime and the air domains that I've worked in. But that cross-government approach really is strong with Rebecca Emerton in, in DSIT, um, with Peter Hagen in MOD, with myself and Paul Bate, amongst a bunch of people in the room. And I think we are fortunate that the space industry is relatively small at the moment. And you mentioned uh, space conference fatigue. It's all of us that get together on a sort of monthly basis. But that means there's really good relationships. And so uh, there are, for me, there are a number of things to be hugely positive about. And I think it puts us in a good place to go into the, uh, into the next spending review, integrated review, whatever it happens to be. Okay, thank you. A, a question that's come through from Manny Shah. Given the increasing threats in the space environment, how is Space Command approaching allied interoperability when it comes to incorporating new capabilities? So I'll kick off again. Um, so interestingly, I mentioned CSPO, and I mentioned really how powerful I saw, and it, absolutely true. When I spoke this morning, when I sat around the room and the delegations from the Five Eyes, France, Germany, Japan, Norway, and Japan, especially when you hear some of the money that's being pumped into these things as well. If I, a point I'll always mention, uh, General Saltzman, head of US Space Force. Uh, if you compare budgets where I had around sort of 60 to 100 million this year, um, nearer the first figure, he's got $30 billion. So all of us are in that room for a year all of us are in that room working out how do we add value? How do we come together as a space coalition? Um, and I think the value of that particular organization, and we're talking about it with NATO, where SAS works as well, is just setting the integration standards that we require. Because if we go, I mean, we do it within our own militaries in that we'll buy stuff that doesn't connect. I think if we're starting in the ground floor, especially as new nations, upcoming nations are starting to build their capability, if we make it interoperable from the beginning and set those standards, then that's where we'll be winning. Okay, if, if I could add to that, I think a success story there is the extent to which industry is incorporated into that process. Um, 
which is far different than it would have been even a decade ago. And Carissa, I wonder if you could take uh, this question. What should the UK's risk appetite be when it comes to defence space for new techs and full programmes? Um, you know, from what you were saying earlier, you think we should take uh, um, more strides in this direction? So, um, that's, that's such an interesting question. Uh, the, there are two areas, I think, where I guess an appetite for risk, I think, would be helpful. Uh, one is in uh, identifying key industry capability areas, whatever they are, and targeting those uh, as um, uh, through government acquisition, through government programs, uh, building that capability, I guess, almost an industrial policy approach, but very focused on specific national security challenges. Um, and I think the other area is to, and there's been progress made here certainly, think about not simply uh, buttressing and augmenting uh, broadly available national security capabilities, space capabilities, but uh, targeting specific uh, UK capabilities that are relatively unique, that provide an asset to allies not available elsewhere. That is potentially expensive. That is potentially risky. I think that is absolutely necessary for a successful, to, to achieve a desirable coalition position over the next decade. Okay, thank you. And uh, John has mentioned the need for action. Will the workforce action plan include clear deliverables and funding to, work, to turn words into actual skilled people? Well, certainly um, the Space Command Workforce Action Plan, uh, which we're in the middle of doing a, a review at the moment to look at what our priorities are for the next financial year and the financial year after that. And that's all about taking um, the resource we've got and, and pushing it into, the, into those priority areas, such as JCO, for instance, or perhaps liaison officers, looking at where we need more personnel on the operational side or the support side, and that work is ongoing at the moment. Um, and then as we bring new capabilities um, into being, there will be options that go with those that, um, that deliver workforce options. So those capabilities must come with that workforce to make them, to make them viable. So there was a long-term plan for that. I mean, I can only really speak for the defence workforce. I wouldn't want to comment on the wider workforce plan. But what I can say is that coordination that I spoke about earlier is really, is really, um, is really key. And there are, there are forums several forums that I sit on from a defence perspective with my civilian colleagues that look at this issue. And there's no doubt we're competing for the same people in some areas. So having an understanding of how you can use the resource that's there more wisely, perhaps through things like reservists that can operate within the space industry in a civilian sense and then um, provide skill sets to defence through reserve service um, or potentially through placements um, and shared training, um, that, that's how we, uh, I think, coordinate this better. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, just to end the day, really, uh, I'm going to end on this question from Sophie Antrobus to Air Vice Marshal Godfrey. If you could go back and give a piece of advice to your January 2021 self, what would it be? And, and do take this opportunity uh, to draw this to a close. Um, I was about to say, don't panic. Um, <laughs> I, I think it would be... Um, to give yourself time. You know, there's an element of wanting to do stuff quickly that is, has forced us into things and forced us into areas that I didn't know that we were going to. But I think what I have done, especially in the last year, having, you know, the first year was carnage, especially in terms of creating relationships, going to see everyone, that sort of stuff. I think I would have still done that. But in terms of how quickly we did things, um, uh, I would just say, relax a little bit it's all going to be all right, you know, and the way that it has sort of come together. And the reason I mentioned, I think we know where we're going now is because we've seen everything, pick the things that we know will probably add value to uh, allies and partners. And I think we can really take that forward. So I think it would be that, you know, just relax a little bit. We've got time. You know, this is a long term thing. You don't have to get everything done in the first year. And final thoughts for the day? For the day, it's been absolutely fantastic. I mean, I could never sum up as well as Doug uh, has, has summed up. But um, it was interesting because we did have a conversation about, you know, do we do the conference this time so close to the UK Space uh, Conference? And 
I'm glad we did. You know, having sat through some just brilliant conversations all the way through uh, today and seeing the engagement from all of you, whether it's in here, out there, um, having done Susanna's job just for a little bit in Belfast, I said I had to stop the conference so that people actually put questions in there. But I've seen Slido is just rammed full of questions today. And that's what we wanted is engagement. And hopefully, it, it, you know, all of you are walking out of here with just some little nugget of information that you're going to take back and try and develop and, you know, at least have taken away that there is a lot of coherence in the United Kingdom. And I completely agree with Carissa in that we can do a lot more to make it more coherent, but we're definitely going in the right direction. So ultimately, it's a massive thank you for everyone who's put it together and for all of you uh, who've been here today. Thank you very much. And just the, the final word to Mark. Uh, I'm sorry about this. You weren't expecting this. But the, um, yeah, so I don't interrupt your drinks. Um, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to Space Command for, uh, for their part of this. Thank you very much to the Freeman Aerospace Institute. Brilliant. All our sponsors, uh, partners, uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, it wouldn't happen without them. So, uh, really, really important part of the day. Uh, thank you very much um, for uh, for attending. Uh, I, I agree. It was a slight. We tried to do a slightly different thing, so we'll see how it validates. Um, but hopefully, it was uh, it was enjoyable. Uh, the main reason I wanted to do it now was because I don't know whether she's coming to drinks. So I'd really like to, uh, to thank Susanna for uh, thank keeping you. us going through the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you all uh, very much. Thanks very much for your participation. It has been very fascinating. Thanks to the, the final panel here. And yes, I will be coming for drinks. I won't, I won't turn that down. And level three, the Riverside Room. So see you there. Thanks again.